now. Okay, Andrew, you're on. Good morning and welcome. My name's Andrew Davis. I head Invest Hong Kong here in the UK. Welcome to our sports and esports webinar this morning. Invest Hong brought to you by Invest Hong Kong. Invest Hong Kong is the government department in Hong Kong responsible for providing a free and confidential service to attract businesses to set up in Hong Kong. For your information, we are recording this webinar, which will be available from the Invest Hong Kong YouTube website. Uh, also, uh, the copy will be sent to all participants along with a PDF of the presentations. So I hope you have a great morning and you find out lots of interesting stuff about Hong Kong, China, Asia, and the sports and esports environment. So I'm now handing over to Marco. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, uh, good morning. My name is Marco van Aarde. I'm working for Cathay Pacific Airways and I'm a member of the Netherlands Hong Kong Association Business Association Board. Um, on behalf of the Netherlands Hong Kong Business Association, a very warm welcome on this webinar with the theme, the business of sports and esports in Hong Kong and mainland China. I would like to thank our co-organizers and partners, the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office and Invest Hong Kong. We have a very interesting program for you today with six guest speakers who will update and inform you about the development and business importance of sports and esports in Hong Kong and mainland China. May I remind you that at the end of this webinar, we have a Q&A session and you can use the hand raise function and then we will unmute you if you have a question. Now it's time, ladies and gentlemen, for our first guest speaker. She's the deputy representative of the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office in Brussels, Ms. Fiona Chow. Ms. Fiona Chow, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marco. Good morning from Brussels. It's my pleasure to join you today in this webinar on the very interesting topic. If you are a frequent traveler to Hong Kong or live in Hong Kong, you know that Hong Kong is not only an international financial and business center, it is indeed also a spot hub with a year-round calendar of world-class sporting events. Next slide, please. I would like to highlight some key factors that makes Hong Kong as an ideal destination for major international sport events. First and foremost, Hong Kong is one of the most visit cities in the world, receiving nearly 65 million visitors in 2018, which is eightfold of the 7.4 million local residents. And so why tourists love to come to Hong Kong? Firstly, Hong Kong has been a long, has been a bridge connecting Asia, including the mainland of China with the rest of the world. The highly efficient Hong Kong International Airport links more than 70 million passengers a year to 220 destinations all over the world. And we are now expanding the airport into three one-way systems. On completion of, in 2024, we will, have a, we will have the capacity to handle up to 100 million passengers a year. Secondly, Hong Kong is a welcoming city as manifested by the fact that Hong Kong maintains an open immigration regime and we welcome tenants from around the world to visit our cities and to work to live, to study, and invest in our city. Currently, nationals of about 170 countries and territory can visit Hong Kong visa-free for business or leisure. Thirdly, our commitment of providing quality services is a key to success of our tourism industries. Our customer-oriented approach makes Hong Kong a popular tourist destination and one of the most robust service economies in the world. So tourists love Hong Kong as it is a place full of contrast, diversities, and dynamism, offering a broad range of tourist products to cater for the diverse interests of visitors. So for sport events hold in Hong Kong, they can attract not only the 7.4 million local population, but many more tourists from the neighboring areas, including mainland China. Next slide, please. To sustain Hong Kong's position as a leading tourist destination, Hong Kong has constantly upgraded itself to offer new experience to visitors. In this regard, the Hong Kong SAR government 
has spared no effort in filling Hong Kong's calendar with spectacular events throughout the year. I would like to highlight the MMARC system launched by the Hong Kong SAR government in 2004 to help local national sport associations organize more major sport events and nurture them into sustainable undertakings. Sport events meeting the assessment criteria will be granted MMARC status. A package of tailor-made sport support measures is provided to meet the list of individual MMARC events to help them evolve into regular, market-oriented and profitable events. The number of recognized MMARC events increased from 4 in 2005 to 15 in 2019. So far, around 186 million Hong Kong dollar has been approved to support the recognized MMARC events. Next slide, please. The slide here shows some examples of the major sports events which has been awarded with MMARC status. Over the year, MMARC events have successfully reinforced Hong Kong's position as the event capitals of Asia. MMARC events also help generate economic benefits for Hong Kong by attracting more, more, more tourists. A research analysis conducted by KPMG China in conjunction with the Business of Sport Network estimates that major sport events held in Hong Kong in 2017 generated an economic impact of 2.1 billion Hong Kong dollars. Next slide, please. Apart from filling Hong Kong's calendar with major sport events, the Hong Kong SAR government is also making substantial investment in upgrading local sport and infrastructures, such as the development of the Kai Duck Sport Parks. The project, the project work of Kai Duck Sport Park is targeted to complete in 2023. The park will provide a wide variety of sport facilities, including a main stadium with a fixed, with a fixed seating capacity of 50,000, an indoor sport center with a seating capacity of up to 10,000, a bowling center with 40 links and a public sport grounds with 5,000 seats. The Kaida Sport Pass is expected to be the home of Hong Kong's current and future major sport events. Next slide, please. So in discussing the impact of major sport events, it is increasingly impossible to ignore e-sports. As an emerging industry, e-sport is a new area with economic development potential which can help boost the local gaming industry and INT development, such as applications of the virtual reality technologies. As a matter of fact, Hong Kong does have the competitive edge to develop esports because the city has a world class ICT infrastructure, and Hong Kong has excellent experience in hosting large scale international events. To enable Hong Kong to seize the opportunity to enter the global esports arena, the Hong Kong SAR government allocated in 2018 100 million Hong Kong dollars for promoting the early stage development of the local e-sport industry, which includes the construction of a dedicated world-class e-sport competition venue at Cyberport, which commenced operation in July, and, uh, in July 2019, and will be developed into a flagship e-sport com digital entertainment center in Hong Kong. Promoting the development of eSports will bring many new alternative career paths for our young people in today's dynamic internet-driven economy. We look forward to seeing a thriving eSports industry in Hong Kong, not just players and game developers, but also a wide range of innovation and technology professionals in areas including digital marketing and live streaming in the years ahead. Next slide, please. In closing, I would like to highlight that Hong Kong's remain resilient amidst the challenges caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Hong Kong is fully switched onto the opportunities ahead as a free, open and welcoming society in the heart of Asia. As always, Hong Kong's offer a full depth of unique experience awaiting visitors to explore in person. So I hope to see you soon in Hong Kong. Thank you. The floor to you, Marco. Thank you very much, Fiona. Um, our next speaker is a racing driver and member of the Jackie Chan DCR racing team. A Dutch-born Chinese racing driver with almost 20 years of experience and currently races in the FIA World Endurance Championship. He was the first Chinese driver ever in Formula One and winner of the iconic Le Mans 24 Hours race. 
Let me introduce you, Mr. Ho Pin Tung. The floor is yours. Thank you, Marco. And good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I would like to take you a bit on a journey uh, about motorsports in Hong Kong and mainland China today. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, telling you a little bit more about the background and why races are being held in China and in Hong Kong, and also about the fan experience, how Chinese sports and motorsports fans actually experience the sport slightly different than they do perhaps in other countries. Next slide, please. Um, before I start, I would like to give a very brief introduction about myself. Mark already mentioned a few points. Um, I'm actually born in the Netherlands, the first generation born from our family, um, Chinese immigrants from uh, Zhejiang province, uh, Wenzhou. And I became the first Chinese driver in F1 when I tested for the BMW Williams team in December 2003, uh, before I became a full-time driver in 2010 with the Renault F1 team. Um, very proud winner of the Le Mans 24-hour race and the first ever driver in 85 editions of the Le Mans 24-hour to end up on the overall podium in an LMP2 car. Um, next slide, please. So I would like to take you back to one week ago in Bahrain before I start, um, because if you're perhaps wondering, uh, racing has restarted for us since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, but under very strict protocols. So last week I raced in Bahrain, uh, as you can see, there is a, a COVID testing center directly at the airport where every racing staff was being tested and after which we had to isolate ourselves um, in the hotel until negative result uh, came back for us. Next slide, please. But it was all worth it because as you can see, uh, we celebrated a very nice victory in the, uh, in the, uh, in the race on uh, Saturday afternoon. Next slide, please. So for those who are not so familiar with motorsport, I would like to give you a little bit of insight on the global motorsport landscape first. So there are basically four official FIA World Championships organized by the global governing body. Uh, Formula One, probably known by most of you, uh, FIA World Endurance Championships are the endurance races in which I race myself. And then you have two off-road championships. One of them is the World Rally Championship. And then another one is World Rally Cross, which is more on a closed stage. Um, from 2021 onwards, um, Formula E will be added as an official uh, world championship as well. Next slide, please. So if we talk about national racing in China, in mainland China, um, there's basically three different championships that are um, dominating and uh, being practiced on a national level. Um, the most popular one of those is probably the Chinese Touring Car Championship and TCR China. So I would like to highlight that a little bit more on the next slide, please. And the reason why I would like to do that is because um, they started relatively early organizing this championship in 2002. Uh, and they, at a very early stage, understood the business story behind motorsport. Um, the company that organized it, uh, Shanghai uh, Lisheng Racing, um, expanded this championship with the help of many local uh, manufacturers. Uh, I think you have to understand that China, China is a very closed country when it comes to motorsport in a way um, and therefore a lot of the local manufacturers um, like to focus on their own market uh, with the cars as those are the only place where those cars are being sold um, and it, it's been a very big success story because Shanghai Lisheng Racing actually went listing on the Shenzhen uh, Stock Exchange in March 2017. So that's you know, shows a bit of the business part behind motorsports in China. Next slide, please. So if we look at Formula One, um, probably known amongst many of you, Formula One has had a Chinese Formula One Grand Prix since 2004. It was first announced in 2002. There was no circuit yet at that time. So had, is, it is on a purpose-built circuit um, in the Jading district. And I think one of the interesting things there um, is the fact that it was very well embraced by the Chinese uh, people back in 2004 uh, because the first event was a total sellout. Um, and ever since, it's actually been one of the more popular races globally, except for the more traditional races such as Silverstone in the UK, Monza in, um, in Italy, etc. Um, there's also been a lot of research done, of course, to what extent uh, a race actually brings benefit to the region. And in 2017, and research has been conducted where the direct economic impact on the region of Shanghai was estimated to be at least 205 million yuan. So 
um, it's quite significant. And I think one thing we need to add there as well, that what you quite often see, not just in Shanghai, but all over China, when racing circuits are being built, it's basically the center of an entire motorsport, uh, sorry, an entire automotive um, city, uh, automotive hub almost. Um, so many car manufacturers, for example, have based themselves around the Shanghai International Circuit, such as NIO, FAW Volkswagen, and most recently uh, Tesla with a new Giga factory. And I think it's also interesting to know that the quality of the cars and the quality of the bill of cars nowadays is to such level that actually Tesla has started to export cars um, from their Shanghai factory to Europe. So there's a big chance if you buy a Model 3 in Europe, in the Netherlands now, it is actually made in Shanghai. So next slide, please. So this was a photo from the very first inaugural Formula One Grand Prix in Shanghai in 2004, the Sinopec Chinese F1 Grand Prix. Uh, title partner, a big Chinese petrol and oil uh, corporation. And pay special attention to the right front of the photo where you see the big grandstands, because if you go to the next slide, you will see that those grandstands have actually disappeared. And that calls for a slight drop in attendance figures as well as a result, but since then they've climbed up. I think another interesting thing to see here is the fact that the Sinopec sponsorship had disappeared and it's now Heineken, which is a title partner. And this is something which I've seen over the two past two decades being involved in motorsports in, in China is the fact that it's very widely embraced by foreign brands and foreign companies who like to market and display their products and brand um, in China, uh, rather than Chinese brands who try to take the brand overseas. So you can see a lot of foreign brands um, being very actively advertising around Chinese uh, races and Chinese motorsport. Next slide, please. So when it comes to Hong Kong, um, Formula E uh, has a race, has had a race in Hong Kong. And before it actually happened, the, uh, let's go back to the history of the, of the race a bit. So basically in January 2014, there were a discussion in Let's Go where it was being discussed whether having a Formula E race in Hong Kong would be beneficial for the city of Hong Kong, obviously. Um, you have to understand at that time, um, Formula E wasn't existent yet. There were plans for the championship. It was announced that the championship would happen. But the first inaugural race actually only happened in... Um, October 2014 in Beijing. So uh, before that, it was just basically a thought that was being sold. So the championship itself, due to the fact that it's fully electric, um, races only on non-permanent street circuits, um, attracted uh, a lot of attention, and especially also from uh, car manufacturers, OEMs. And it really um, uh, got a lot of attention and uh, was embraced by the industry and fans as a result as well. So. Um, a year after, in October 2015, a more formal discussion in Let's Go, uh, where the proposal was made to actually stage uh, a Formula E race in Hong Kong a year after, in October 2016. So next slide, please. So actually, that happened. So um, the first ever race was uh, was being held uh, being held in October 2016. But why would uh, a city? just in general, but especially, of course, Hong Kong, uh, would like to host a race of Formula E. Um, I think some of the things were already touched upon by, my, by the previous speaker, uh, Fiona, but obviously uh, hosting a race brings significant economic and public uh, benefits to, uh, to Hong Kong. Um, the, um, the Hong Kong brand, obviously, very strong. Uh, the reinforcement of uh, Hong Kong as a status for, as a capital for events in Asia, I think also it's to show Hong Kong on the global stage. You can see that a bit in Formula One as well, where um, countries, cities opt to have a race um, just to showcase their, um, their country and city to the world. Um, one must not forget that um, Formula One, for example, by in terms of numbers, uh, viewership numbers, is only surpassed by Olympics and World Cup soccer. However, those are events that are only held every once in a four years time, where Formula One, also Formula E, uh, are multiple times each year. Next slide, please. So the first inaugural uh, Formula E Grand Prix in uh, Hong Kong was held in October 2016. 
And um, it wasn't the first time a race car drove through the streets in Hong Kong because that happened in 2011 when Toro Rosso, the sister team of Red Bull, uh, did a demo um, through the streets of Hong Kong with a Formula One car. But it was the first ever car race. And they chose the probably most iconic location you could ever imagine, which was the Victoria Harbour Street Circuit uh, right in Central. And I think one of the important things you have to understand about Formula E and also about the format of the championship, that it's all focused around a one-day event. So basically, uh, all the racing, practice, qualifying, and the race itself all happen in one day. So this is more ideal to hold races in city centers, obviously, as the disruption road closures will be very limited. Next slide, please. So as you can see, um, it touches a little bit back on motivations why to hold a race. These images have gone around the entire world, um, the street circuit at uh, Victoria uh, Harbor. Next slide, please. I think there's a very, a very um, famous saying by uh, Bernie Ecclestone, who is the person that made Formula One to the commercial success uh, as it is today. And his, his statement was that the only time it is about racing is on the Sunday afternoon, Formula E on Saturday, uh, between 2 and 4 p.m. when the race actually happens. Other than that, it's just business. So a big important role, part of the, the weekend for Formula E is also the so-called Hong Kong Emotion Club, which is the corporate VIP hospitality. Uh, I'm there as well um, with our team principal, Jagger Racing. <laughs> Next slide, please. So there's always a lot of um, VIPs and guests. Uh, here you can see Carrie Lam, who visited the race as well, um, uh, and the Emotion Club as well. And I think it's interesting to note that the Hong Kong uh, race had over 2,000 uh, corporate guests. Next slide, please. And the 2,000 corporate guests actually accounted for the highest number and the highest attendance in terms of uh, guests uh, globally for any Formula E race held. Um, the Formula E race in general also had the largest key market audience um, of all races around the globe. And this is quite interesting, especially considering the fact that the race time was relatively unfavorable. Um, 4 p.m. on Saturday afternoon, obviously, is 10 a.m. in countries like Netherlands or Germany, for example. And for the teams and the partners involved in the championship, the race also proved to be the race with the highest average media value return, which was based on reports done by Nielsen. Next slide, please. So last topic I'd like to touch upon is, is the fan experience. It's not just particularly for motorsports, but um, more in general, perhaps. Um, I think Chinese fans in general have a slightly different way of experiencing sports. What I quite often see at our races, for example, is that at the start of the race in Shanghai, you will have a full grandstand of audience, uh, tens and tens of thousands of spectators. And then just after maybe one, two, three hours into the race, our races are relatively long, um, you see those grandstands becoming slightly empty. Does that mean that the fans have stopped watching? Uh, no, they actually watch the race and continue to watch the race in a different way through apps on their mobile phone, for example, through social media. Uh, I think it also, a uh, funny thing there is to add is the fact that there's a Chinese saying, which says, um, which means I've been there. So a lot of people like to go there, experience the feeling, and then basically go home and watch the race, uh, continue to watch the race or the sport to their own liking. Um, another thing is I think Chinese fans are very focused on uh, personalities. And uh, in addition to that, Chinese fans are uh, very focused on winners. I think globally, Chinese uh, fans, of course, are very privileged uh, due to the sporting success they've enjoyed around the globe. Um, so when Formula One, for example, first came to Shanghai, uh, I think that most eyes were focused on Michael Schumacher. Perhaps Schumacher was bigger than the Formula One race itself. Of course, he was racing a Ferrari in a red car, which obviously is ideal in China. Um, but he also was the most successful driver at that moment. So automatically, he received a lot of those uh, attention. Uh, last point, I will touch upon a little bit later what the effect is of having a local team um, in a global championship. So next slide, please. 
So when it comes to the social media uh, landscape, obviously, as many of you are aware, it's slightly different in China where there are always Chinese equivalents for the different kind of social media, such as uh, Weibo, which is basically uh, WeChat by Tencent, that is a combination of many different apps, uh, TikTok, Douyin, uh, et cetera. Next slide, please. Um, as I touched before also, there's a very different way that athletes are being viewed. Never could I imagine that I would appear on billboards with no racing related anything at all um, in a subway in Shanghai, for example. Next slide, please. And the same thing also applies when it comes to the way that the media approaches you. This was actually done by a Prestige magazine uh, in Hong Kong, where they selected me as one of the 40 under 40 to watch um, in Hong Kong. So yeah, very proud of that as well, of course. Next slide, please. So I just mentioned before, um, the influence of a local team in a championship. So uh, of course it's greatly helped by the fact that I'm racing for a team that is co-owned and co-founded by one of the world's perhaps most famous movie stars, Jackie Chan. And um, when we first entered the FIA World Endurance Championship in 2017, the viewership in China was, I would say, close to zero. Um, we then started racing in the championship, live broadcasting, not on TV, but only online through live streaming um, was done, uh, supported by Chinese commentary. And we literally saw the TV or the viewership numbers explode. And not just for the first year, but obviously also for the second year, where we had 164% uh, growth to um, almost 10 million unique viewers per race uh, that year. Next slide, please. So to close off, a little bit adding to what I said previously, um, uh, that the way athletes are being viewed differently. Uh, this is something perhaps some of you have seen, if not, um, please go to YouTube and search for Dragon Challenge. It's actually a stunt uh, that I did for Jaguar Land Rover in which I drove uh, a, a Range Rover uh, Sport up to one of the most iconic um, tourist sites in China at the Tianmen Mountain and did something that uh, even myself could never imagine it was possible. So um, uh, thank you for your attention and um, back to you, Marco. Thank you very much, Hopin, for giving your insights in the development of motorsports in China and Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is a writer, a former table tennis champion and former correspondent for NRC Handelsblad. She played table tennis at world level for more than 25 years, and she won a total of five European single titles. She belonged to the best 10 players in the world, and she trained extensively in China in the 80s and 90s. Um, let me introduce Ms. Bettine Frieskoop. Bettine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marco. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm pleased to share with you uh, my knowledge uh, and experience about sports in China. As Marco said, I have been playing table tennis for over 40 years and uh, I have practiced also in the beautiful National Sports Center of, of Hong Kong twice. Um, uh, Hong Kong uh, was uh, also the city uh, where I, I arrived by plane in 1980 before I could enter China via Guangzhou and in Dutch we call it uh, by then Canton and uh, travel to uh, to Beijing for my training first training camp in uh, in China. Um, in 1997 I was an eyewitness as a journalist when Hong Kong was handed over to to China. This was a um, a quite, uh, quite extraordinary uh, happening by then. Um, that was um, in 1997, I, as, I, as I told you. Um, Hong Kong, uh, of course, has been under the influence of China already uh, since uh, Hong Kong was an English concession after the Opium Wars. And uh, that's why also many mainland Chinese sports people play for national teams of Hong Kong that all, all has always been at the forefront of modern sports in Southeast uh, East Asia. Um, before I come to speak about uh, modern sports in China, let me take you back to, to sport in, anci uh, in ancient China. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, today, uh, sports is global. It's, it's everywhere and it's for everybody, so to say. Um, in China, sports goes way back into the history of the ancient emperors. In those days, it was not everywhere and it was not uh, for everybody. It was played in the court, you know, uh, for uh, the court of the, the Chinese emperors. It was for the elite the high officials and noblemen responsible for the emperor's administration. And uh, as a matter of fact, sport was their entertainment. And um, let me see where they inter entertained themselves with. Next slide, please. Now, did you ever think that soccer was invented in England? Well, that's wrong, because uh, during the Han Dynasty, two centuries before Christ, Chiju, a kind of football, was immensely popular uh, in, in the Chinese imperial uh, courtyards. And it was also played by women with a kind of uh, ball from, yeah, made from, from fabric. Um, I think it's important to mention that sport as a physical exercise of the human body has always been a distinct, uh, yeah, distinct feature of the Chinese cultural conscience. Uh, the unity of the body and spirit, mind and spirit, was as important as you can say in Taoism, uh, Taoism as it was in ancient uh, Athens and Rome. Um, sports has been um, introduced by Mao Zedong again, and uh, by then uh, the Chinese people, they were called uh, the sick men of Asia, the ill men of Asia. Uh, Mao Zedong thought it, the Chinese people were not that fit uh, as they should be and uh, as, uh, as to be a strong country to conquer the world, uh, the, the Chinese people must play sports uh, to, be, to be fit again and to, to be strong and to, in order to have a, 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 a strong army. And therefore Mao Zedong, he said, well, uh, let's play table tennis. And so he actually made table tennis popular um, and also Everyone knows he swam over the, the Yangtze. Uh, this is a kind of iconic, um, yeah, how to say, the iconic photos went all over the world. Mao Zedong swimming in the Yangtze, but also playing table tennis. Um, table tennis, next slide, please. Um, was not in the over, in, is not in this overview. It's a, it's a young sports. In, in China, it was important. Uh, it was imported by the, the British colonialists. They did not know where to play lawn tennis and invented uh, it out of boredom. As for myself, um, I played table tennis at the sport, uh, top sport level for about 30 years and went to China, as Marco said, many, many times to practice and learn from the Chinese. Uh, back then in the 80s, table tennis was maybe more popular than it is now. Uh, when I, when I speak about how many people play table tennis in China. Uh, by then, almost, I think, uh, about 80% of the population play table tennis, and now that's less, but still it's, I think, 350 million people play table tennis daily, and uh, about 200, uh, tw uh, um, 25 million people play it on a more or less professional basis. Well, that's unbelievable, you know, 25 million people. Back to my um, training camps in China. Next slide, please. Uh, you see me playing here uh, in my uh, beginning 30s, but uh, 10 years uh, before that, I went to China, as I said, in 1980. And uh, I want to tell you something about what I learned from China uh, when I went there. Next slide, please. First, I'd like you to tell you something about my camp in Beijing 1980. Here you see a picture taken in uh, during the Olympic Games. I went back to the place where I started to practice in China. It's not, it, back then it was not that modern. The, the pathways were sent, and, uh, but still the Mao Zedong statue was there. Uh, after an exhausting five-day trip, there in, were no direct flights in those days. When you went to China, you wanted to go to China, you had to fly on Hong Kong. And, uh, and when you arrived in Hong Kong, you could take the train to Guangzhou. And then uh, you can take 
either the in in um, the the local flight or go by train to the hinterland of China. Well, I took the train 47 hours from Guangzhou to Beijing, and after this exhausting five-day trip, I arrived at my destination, a sports campus on the outskirts of Beijing. Uh, during my three-month stay, I was completely cut off from the outside world, but my impressions of Beijing are still etched in my mind. Next slide, please. Uh, the Chinese had, uh, you see me standing here with my two coaches and uh, with the lady I was together with in this camp, first camp. Uh, the Chinese had amazing hand-eye coordination and explosive power. They were also able to bear hardship. They didn't complain. They were incredibly patient and could learn from their mistakes. The Chinese always said the mistakes are the pillars of the success. In the afternoon, we started with one hour only service practice and then afterwards two hours multi-ball. A bamboo basket full of ping pong balls, ammunition was fired at me at a murderous pace until my shoes were blood stained. I saw that everything was extremely simple, but in this simplicity they could master their skills. Uh, over the next 20 years, next slide please. You see me sitting here uh, writing uh, uh, letters home and also keeping my diary what I learned from the Chinese. And in this time, you can imagine there were no Western products. You could not even buy like, for instance, a cup of coffee or Coca-Cola didn't exist in the, back then in the 80s. And I could not call home because it was in, uh, impossible to, to call from the center. I had to go to the post office and there I stood for six hours in a row in a long row to in order to make a phone call home. So I didn't do that because I was exhausted after six days training. Um, uh, over the next 20 years, I returned to China many times. Next slide, please. And uh, I find that my table tennis success opened the door to discovering this country and its people. And now that I'm older, I can put a lot of things more in perspective. How come all these people play so well table tennis? How come nobody can beat them? Where do they get this incredible technique? They, their unbelievable skill, their strategy that you can never figure out. Clearly the game has rooted in the genes of the Chinese people. The game matches their physical talent fed by a history of highly sophisticated martial arts. Um, the modern uh, Chinese are, are made actually for the game. Next slide, please. And then, of course, you see here a map of China. Uh, the, uh, and uh, I want to say something about uh, the, the system of the, of, the, of the sports. And this was actually founded by, uh, in the 1950s, first by the missionaries, longer before, who, invent, who introduced sports uh, after the Opium Wars, when they were actually uh, able to, to travel freely uh, um, among uh, along China, and they also introduced uh, the edu Western education system, but also the, 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 the sports in China. Um, there is uh, the law of the numbers accounting for the huge sp sports pyramid, of course, in China, because when you can select from 25 million uh, players, of course, that's, you have a big advantage. Um, until a decade ago, the reservoir of top talents was without limit, but this is now changing. So the sports pyramid, so like also the political, political system is actually uh, organized in China. So you have the special sports schools in the provinces and the, the, the provinces uh, um, select uh, from this special sports school to, uh, to, to their provincial teams and then the provincial teams they are competing with the national team, uh, national teams in Beijing, and also from the national youth teams. But something is changing, and that's very interesting because 25 years ago, um, uh, table tennis, not only table tennis but all sports, were government funded. But uh, and this system, as I told you, was actually derived uh, from the Soviet Union system in the race for sporting uh, supremacy. And this was very important. 
um, especially, of course, for Mao Zedong, you know, to to have stronger people. So in order to make stronger China, you must play sports. Um, you see here a map of 23 provinces and the middle of the pyram pyramid consists of the professional uh, teams and young students, they receive 100 or 200 euro lodging per month and uh, parents also have to com contribute uh, as well and more and more they have to contribute. Uh, the situation began to change in 1994 when Chinese football became the first sports to be professionalized and it, in its wake similar commercial reforms were carried out in basketball, volleyball, table tennis and chess. So it became professional and the teams were sponsored. And this was very special because of course, it, this was, was also because Mao, uh, Deng Xiaoping opened China for the Western, uh, West, for Western business. But actually uh, in some uh, sports and especially table tennis, the old pyramid system prevailed uh, alongside the commercialization of sports. Uh, next slide, please. In uh, 2008, I happened to meet Yang Ying, uh, Yang Yang. Uh, she was a former uh, speed skate champion and the founder uh, of the Champions Foundation, advocating for the interests and, and rights for, of retired sports people in China. And she said, recruitment is where the problems begin. For some sport, it just doesn't pay to play. So the old system is failing. Yang Yang said. So the market economy has already changed how the sports system works in China and state sports schools like to give uh, kids a chance at a lifetime of success, but it's more likely that they just will end up undereducated and underprepared in a competitive world. So the sports say, uh, 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 state sports system will gradually transform into a club, university, and college sports system from which talents will be recruited to the national team. Um, the well-being and education of young talents will get more intentions from the sports authorities. So China understands also that happy, balanced people at the end will have more success and they have to think what will become of me after my sports career. So next slide, please. So in recent years, China has greatly invested in producing excellence in international highly praised sports. So like football, tennis, golf, basketball, because before China actually was good at the Olympic sports um, and they called it circus sports, you know, because the, the, the Chinese, they are very flexible and they can practice many, many hours and this kind of sports where you have to to put a lot of hours, they were good in this kind of sports, but actually they wanted to make the difference in this kind of modern sports, athletics, football, golf, basketball. So they put a lot of attention, a lot of money, and also a lot of uh, energy and uh, try to change the system in order to become good in this international highly praised sports. Well, do you know this kind of uh, athletes, Liu Shang, Yao Ming, Wu Lei, Tianlong Guang, they are very popular in China, of course, but in the West, nobody knows their names because this is also a problem. The Chinese names, you know, people find it uh, very difficult to, you know, to, to have, um, to, yeah, to remember this kind of names. This is a real problem for China, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, China has her own Messi on, uh, and her own Golf Tiger. This is 21 year old uh, Wu Lei and uh, 90 year old Qian Long Guang. He is uh, a very big sports um, um, yeah, legend in, in China. And of course, next slide please. We all know Lina. She is a, a female tennis player and she won the op Open uh, Australia in 2011 and 2014. I don't mention, for instance, Chen Meng or uh, or uh, Ding Ning, they are very popular table tennis player, players and uh, very uh, well known in China. Uh, they cannot go over the street before without recognizing. And also they are very rich, uh, but uh, nobody knows them in, in the Western countries, of course. Next slide, please. Well, you see here some figures about golf because um, um, golf is, 
is quite popular now. You see 400,000 prof and every year 10% growth. And uh, uh, if you want to be a member of, for instance, a very well-known uh, golf club in, in uh, Shanghai, you have to pay 230,000 uh, uh, US dollar to, you know, to enter the club. And so you must be really rich uh, to, uh, uh, to, to be a member. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the most popular team sports in China, next slide, please, are basketball and football. And uh, Xi Jinping has announced uh, that he wants China to be a real football nation. Many foreign players and coaches are invited to China to share their knowledge, even by means of e-learning programs. Uh, the most popular individual sport besides table tennis, as I said, is golf. And um, to compare, uh, China has about... Uh, 10 million professional of 25 million table tennis players and uh, the, the table tennis star stars are also extremely uh, famous and but as I said this is real changing and many many other sports are entering China next slide please um, we uh, to conclude we saw that sport was popular entertainment among the elite the noble and the rich in the era of the emperors in the 50s of the last century, the Chinese embraced the Soviet model of top sports. A sports pyramid was erected to spot talents. And uh, people from the lower social classes started to engage in sports as the rich started to sponsor their studies. Now, Chinese uh, pyramid system is gradually transforming into a college and university model and also very commercial sponsor entering sports. And China is conscious of the fact that the broad and deep knowledge is required to, to become a top athlete. National excellence in sports depends on the excellent men and women to, who have to represent themselves as a sports personality in the international sports arenas. Um, so they also have to learn English because many uh, Chinese athletes, they are not able to speak uh, English uh, and cannot express themselves. Um, in front of the media. I explained during my presentation that culture play an important role in the development of sports. And when I was young, I went to China to learn from the Chinese and their culture. And in modern times of the internet, things are far more easy. We can now teach 50,000 trainers by means of e-learning from, for, for instance, the, the Dutch are doing that uh, to, to, uh, to teach the Chinese football. Uh, so in, uh, we can build a whole new system and culture which fits to the Chinese sports system. In this way, we bring soccer back actually where it started and where it belongs in, in China. In this next slide, you see a young talented golf player. Uh, be, uh, behind her is her mother. She is her trainer. She is a highly educated um, uh, uh, woman. She is a professor. But she quitted her job uh, in order to help a daughter who wants to study at Stanford, where she can combine study and golf. So sports has become not a way to escape poverty, as it was uh, in previous days, in, in former days. But in a way, uh, playing sports um, has, way, has returned to, to the elite, to put, it, to put it bluntly, to get rich and educate the new generation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bettina, for sharing your insights um, in the history of the sports and linking that to the modern sports in China. And also good to see um, your experiences in China. Thank you very much. Our next Thank you. Speaker, our next speaker is COO at Text Gaming. Text Gaming is a leading UK esports organization. Ms. P. T. Liao, the floor is yours. Hello, good morning and good afternoon uh, to everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, very honored today to talk about esports um, and with a particular attention on how to utilize esports as a marketing tool and also um, as a marketing tool to reach to this particular audience that we have and a particular uh, generation, which is millennial and Gen Z. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a video that I selected, uh, but uh, for technical reasons, we can't show it here. So there's actually about four um, videos in my presentation. So if you're interested after the 
webinar today, please contact me. I will send you the links uh, with pleasure. Next slide, please. Uh, so a little word on VEST Gaming. So as Marco said, uh, VEST Gaming is the UK's leading eSport organization. Uh, what is an eSport organization? And um, we are actually similar to a traditional sport club. Uh, so we work with athletes, uh, so teams and players in different games. Uh, we have sponsors, we commercialize merchandising. Um, and what is very important in uh, eSport organizations' life is social media because our audience is young. They use social media as a channel. So social media is our main communication channel uh, to this uh, particular audience. Uh, on the upper right corner, you see a photo, uh, which is a uh, content, a video content that we made for our sponsor, eBio.com together with their partner, uh, Leeds United Football Club. So we do a lot of this kind of marketing, what we call today collaborative marketing, that you bring different parties to do uh, the same marketing campaign. Next slide, please. So uh, eSports, uh, eSport is short for electronic sport. Uh, which is the professional competitive part of the gaming industry. Uh, I think a lot of people of my generation, I mean, I'm generation X, uh, my generation or my generation above would think that eSport or video gaming competition is just um, young people or nerds playing their bedroom. But uh, I will show you with all these figures that I uh, put on, on this slide that uh, it's no longer that kind of industry. So on the audience figure, we are actually already the eighth most popular sport in the world with 495 million uh, audience worldwide. And it's growing at an average of 14% year on year. Uh, so much that it became popular, uh, Netflix actually made a very interesting statement last year. Uh, stating Fortnite, uh, a very popular esport and video game, uh, it's a bigger rival to them than HBO because more people, a, a person who spend more time on playing Fortnite games or watching Fortnite related content, it's a person who is not watching Netflix. So we are uh, really a competition on the entertainment level uh, to other entertainment service providers. Um, esports, I think COVID actually make esports stand out as a sport um, because as esports has a digital nature, uh, esports during the first COVID lockdown is also the only sport that uh, um, the tournament is still going on. So it's a sport that we can function 100% digitally. Um, and with a very interesting uh, number uh, for uh, with a survey carried out by PricewaterhouseCoopers that during the lockdown, two thirds of under 35 years old uh, claims that they play or watch uh, gaming content. So let's look a little bit, a little bit deeper what uh, is particular about this uh, audience. Next slide, please. So uh, millennial Gen Z is the, the population that actually mainly uh, form the audience of eSports. So we, they are young uh, because of their age and they are tech savvy because we cannot forget that eSports is basically a sport that we need computer uh, to play with. Um, so they normally, it's an uh, audience who knows about computing, they know about social media video, they know all kinds of software, and they are in the more wealthy demographic of the world because they need a certain financial capacity to invest in computers. Uh, I don't know if you ever look at the price of uh, gaming computing um, equipment, I really uh, invite you to have a look. Uh, it, they are not very cheap uh, equipment. So this is the main demographic um, of the eSports audience. 
And now let's have a look uh, deeper on their behaviors. So next slide, please. So when we talk about uh, Millennial and Gen Z, uh, which is kind of simple, but I think it's important to uh, point out. So on the left-hand side of the, the this slide, you can see the technology preference per generation. Okay, I'm born in the generation that I was born in analog and I learned to use digital. But millennial Gen Z are generation who are born in digital. So this obviously together with the technology evolution, their natural choice of technology platform of, on their daily working or their daily life are quite different from our generation. And this technology choice actually influenced their media consumption behavior, which uh, result that this is a generation who doesn't watch TV anymore. They don't watch advertisement any, anymore. They value more VOD podcasts, uh, streamer influencers, and uh, collaborative marketing. So as the um, technology is changing the media consumption behavior is changing, the platform that they use to communicate is also changing and the way that we should communicate to them uh, should be changed as well. Uh, so next slide, please. So here you see, I, I'm just only, only putting out a few very famous gaming related social media platform and live streaming platform. Uh, there's actually much more than this, uh, but these are the famous ones. Uh, so it's just to point out that if your company uh, wants to sell a service to the millennial and Gen Z or younger generation, you will have to use their channel and talk their language. Otherwise they are not interested to listen to you because they have no patience. Um, so uh, afterwards, I'll give you three examples of uh, marketing campaigns that either we promote product or promote a city uh, by using eSports. So next slide, please. So the first example uh, is one of our examples. So we made this video uh, for our sponsor Logitech, who is producing a simulation racing kit. Um, so we actually team up um, our simulation racing driver with a YouTuber who used to be a real car racing driver, uh, have them race on the same track, one digitally, one physically, and then we compare um, how their time is and who is the best driver. Um, so it's a, a very interesting way to bring a digital racing community with a physical racing community together and pr promoting a physical product. So this is an uh, example of what we called collaborative marketing. Uh, the next one, please. So the second one is a music uh, promotion example. So Tra Travis uh, Scott is an American rapper uh, who chose this year to promote his new track release on, in a video game, which is called Fortnite. Uh, so Fortnite, uh, what they did is they created an island inside their game for Travis Scott uh, releasing event. Um, so gamers who play a Fortnite game can go onto this island with their avatar um, and participate to this release. So the event is actually participated by 28 million people. Um, so I think that's quite a huge success compared to a traditional music uh, release. Next one, please. So this is uh, a little bit uh, similar to what uh, Fiona has mentioned earlier on how Hong Kong want to uh, promote itself uh, towards the esports industry. So if you don't you are not in eSports, you probably will not know the city Katowice. Uh, but if you ask any eSports fans in this world, they will tell you Katowice is in Poland. Katowice is about Counter-Strike, uh, Intel, it's string master tournament. So Katowice uh, is one of the first city 
um, embracing and host esport tournament and today become one of the cinnamon of uh, esport. Um, so I think this is a quite successful example uh, and actually set the trend today. A lot of CT, secondary third uh, range CT are looking to associate themselves with esport event in order to bring younger tourism and also create a job opportunity uh, related to, to this industry. Next, please. So a little glance on the Chinese market. Um, the Chinese market about esports and gaming, there's too many things to say. Uh, we can spend hours and hours on this. Uh, but what is important uh, for you to remember uh, after this presentation, China is actually one of the biggest gaming country in the world. And I think uh, the reason that two parts, one is the social environment and the other is the obviously the, the power of investment. Uh, socially, China, because of single child policy, because of the working environment, we have a huge amount of single adults who work far from their family, who work very long hours, so they don't really have time to travel uh, to be entertained, but they will need a very short and accessible entertainment. So gaming become one of the most popular entertainment for Chinese people. And obviously Tencent as a company has seen the potential. So Tencent started um, actually actively um, invest not only in Chinese gaming related companies, but also internationally. So Tencent today is actually the, big, the world's biggest video game vendor who has investment in almost all the famous game developing companies. So with Tencent's um, investment, um, I'm sure uh, I'm not wrong to say that this industry is here to stay and will grow um, every day more solid than ever. Next, please. So um, e-sport is a sport. Um, a lot of people will still maybe um, uh, argue on that, but it is a reality already in China. So China's evolution uh, in eSport uh, started in 1998. Um, so they kind of evolved from a country where it consumes uh, games uh, coming from outside the world, but to today that they actually produce their own titles and organize a lot of um, important tournaments. And the most important, I think, uh, for here to point out is that eSport player and eSport manager is actually officially uh, recognized as a new profession and eSport is considered as a sport. So if uh, the audience uh, is interested in investing in China or in Hong Kong, um, please do consider the eSport uh, industry and the gaming industry. Next, please. So just to conclude, um, if you're an investor, if you're interested in entertainment, if your company is selling product service solutions to millennial and Gen Z, please remember the word esports uh, and remember that the audience needs special treatment. They use different communication platform and they want you to create special content for them to communicate um, and talk their language. Thank you very much. Back to you, Marco. Thank you very much, Faith, for uh, giving us an insight and taking us in the world of esports. Our next speaker is the CEO and co founder of Hero. Hero radically changes today's centralized way of online betting. Mr. Paul Polterauer, the floor is yours. Thanks, Marco. Yeah, I am Paul. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm the CEO and co founder of Hero. And what we have is an esports betting solution that runs on the blockchain. Um, but we do betting a bit different than, let's say, the big betting companies. Um, yeah, our startup started in 2014. And yeah, I will tell you a bit more now about our show and use case. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So we at Hero have a really clear vision. Um, we believe and we are convinced that esports 
will become the biggest sport we have ever seen. Um, and what's the reason for that? Why, why do we think that? Because um, for me and for us, esports is the most accessible sports that we have ever seen. So what do I mean um, by that? If you think about soccer, you would need uh, 11 friends, you would need a soccer court, you would need a ball. If you think, I'm coming from Austria, about skiing, you need skis, skiing booths, special clothes, and um, all you need is slope and snow, which is also becoming very rarely in Austria. But for esports, all you need nowadays is your smartphone. That's all you need. Most of the esports titles are also playable now on smartphone. You download an app, log in, takes you like two minutes, and you can start your gaming career. And you know how it is in, like in real sports, if you ever played soccer, you're more likely to become a soccer fan and watch the games because you know what's going on, you know how it feels like to win, how it feels like to play. And yeah, as I said, um, esports is super accessible, just your smartphone in the hand and you can start. And then you can rely on what the professional gamers are doing. So I think this is the a super easy, but uh, very convincing reason for us why esports will be the biggest sports we have ever seen globally. Um, next slide, please. So, but um, we are not only in the esports market, but also in the betting market. And um, what we have seen in the last years, the big betting providers, um, they think that esports is kind of a niche. We talk to them, they say, okay, yeah, we don't know what to do with it. And then they say, come on, this is not, not really sport, right? <laughs> but thanks to Corona, so this is one of the few advantages Corona has or had, um, they are now realizing, okay, this is the only sport that's really going on. <laughs> like if you think back in, in March, so the only sport available, it's um, super easy to continue even if we have pandemic crisis. People don't actually need to meet. The audience can watch online, super convenient. Um, so I think, um, yeah, Corona really boosted the, the esports development. Traditional NBA players can, couldn't play in the league, so they started to play NBA uh, as an esports title against one uh, each other. And um, yeah, people would watch it. And also people that didn't fancy esports before um, also watched their traditional sports starts competing in esports then. So, and also um, betting providers are now aware of esports. We are now in contact with a few because they really want to tap into the esports potential. Yeah, so far about the market and now to our product, what are we are actually offering? Next slide, please. Um, yeah, we want to disrupt the online betting market. So what's, what's wrong with online betting? Next slide, please. Um, I don't like the feeling like for traditional betting, I'm as a user, I get set up against the bookmaker, against the company. They will provide me with odds. And statistically, if I bet often enough, all my money will move from my pockets to the betting provider. So this is the traditional model. Next slide. Um, but we have, we have a solution to that. We let the community bet against each other. So I could uh, bet against, let's say, this group chat we have here. Um, or I can bet within my company or just um, against other people. And it's like in esports, right? You have a community and you could compete within the community. And yeah, this is called fantasy betting. Um, we have seen that in the US, there are already two big unicorns offering that. And we are one of the first doing this uh, in Europe. Um, next slide, please. And to also provide uh, trust and um, security, security and also transparency, uh, we're using blockchain to provide this peer-to-peer -peer betting system. And also, we're not only using blockchain, but we created our own cryptocurrency. With, um, with this currency, people could bet on our platform. And we did the first ICO, so initial coin offering, which is like an IPO, but instead of shares, you're offering your own currency. Uh, we did the first regulated one in Austria and probably also the first regula regulated ICO in the whole European Union. Um, we managed to raise 2 million US dollars back in 2017 with this ICO. And what's really cool, we didn't need any VC, we didn't need any bank, 
um, we just created a smart contract on our website and people could invest directly on our website with Ethereum or Bitcoin and they would, send, would get sent back um, automatically our coin. So we didn't need any third party to actually host the ICO and collect the money. And yeah, that was in 2017. Next slide, please. So sounds like a fancy idea doing um, blockchain community betting for esports. Um, does it work? Yes, for us it works quite well so far. Um, we created the first showcase for that, and the platform is called Herosphere.gg, where you can actually wager, as I said, in our own cryptocurrency that is called Play. You can also wager in Ethereum or in US dollars. So far, we have over 300,000 people using our platform. We wagered already more than um, 32 million play of our, of our own cryptocurrency on the platform. And yeah, we're offering the, in our opinion, the three biggest esports titles that is Dota 2, League of Legends, and um, CSGO. And yeah, next year we will go to, to bring more titles to our to our platform. Next slide, please. Um, this is the development of the platform. So um, you see the amount wagered on the platform really uh, rose dramatically. So over 35% in the last 12 months. Um, so yeah, it's a good sign for us that the platform is growing strongly and also now um, esports hype during Corona and crypto market is going up the last few weeks. So this will also even help us further with the good development. Next slide, please. Yeah, so besides the betting platform, we also have, as you see here, we have a community chat, we have the streams from the games on our platform. So we really wanna build up a community. And that's what also is missing on traditional betting providers. Normally on a betting provider, you would go to the platform, log in, place your bet, that's it. On our platform, we have a community chat. You can watch the games live. Um, yeah, we have a, a leaderboard system where you can lead, like rank up against all the other guys with every contest you're winning. Uh, we have gamification, so you can um, collect levels, you can collect batches. And yeah, what we're really looking forward in the next step is to also enable this betting really live. So while watching the stream, you could also change your bets, um, changing the people you have chosen. This will be the next step for us and also uh, creating more, offering more cryptocurrencies on our platform besides our own and Ethereum. And um, yeah, we also wanna provide white label solution for other betting providers because um, in the last year, a lot of betting providers approached us if they uh, could have a white label from our product. And two years ago, they, uh, they thought esports is not, not a thing, not a sport. So now esports is like growing really fast. And yeah, it's a really, really nice development to see. Next slide, please. Yeah, here you can see our team. Um, this is like the core team is four members. Um, and on the left side, you see the two co-founders, um, Philip Beinsold, who takes care of all the um, technical stuff. And myself, I'm more like the business development and financial guy. And yeah, we have also Michael and Oleg on board and a few more people that are helping us. Philip Einzel is also in the audience um, today, I think. So yeah, hi, Philip. <laughs> Next slide, please. Yeah, we, we have been in Hong Kong in 2017 for one month because the Asian market is very interesting for us. Uh, we also have a lot of users in, in Asia. Uh, we got awarded as a born global champion by the Austrian Chamber of Commerce. And next slide, please. Um, in the last presentation, we've seen a lot of esports numbers, which was already, I think, very sufficient. A few things I want to um, highlight is that China is the largest esports market, actually, followed by the US and then Western Europe. For us, um, China would be interesting, but it's really hard to enter as an Austrian European company. I think you would need a partner from, from China. So that's why we're opting now as our next expansion beside Europe, we focus more on the US market. Um, yeah, I can later on in the, the Q&A session tell you a bit more about that. Um, next slide, please. Um, we see esports has still a big 
growing year to year rate and yeah the revenue surpassed 1 billion already last year so this is also quite amazing and the next slide please here you can see the list of the top games and as i said we opted for league of legends counter strike and dota which are also exactly the three largest esports titles we can see um, uh, in watched hours and i think also revenue wise and now the last slide please yeah if you have any questions you can contact us anytime um, or you can try our platform it's uh, heroesphere.gg and yeah thanks and back to marco and looking forward to the q and a later on thanks very much paul for uh, guiding us through the fast growing uh, world of esports and online betting thanks very much welcome it's now time for our last speaker um, he's the managing director and co-founder of esports insider a company based in london founded in 2016 esports insider is an industry focused esports news platform b2b agency media and events company mr sam cook the floor is yours thank you very much marco and thank you to invest hk for for having me so what we're going to go over today so we'll do a bit of an overview of the esports ecosystem we've gone over that already in a couple of the previous sessions so i'll i'll zoom through that and then tell you a bit more about who esi are and what we do and then in turn break down um piece by piece i guess how the esports industry is laid out how the money flows who the key stakeholders are and so on so next slide please so what is esports we'll go through this very quickly as i said we've we've been over it in a couple of presentations already but esports is just another word for competitive video gaming what does that mean that is people playing people so this is an important one to say into your mirror and remember time and again not all video games are esports but all esports are video games um esports are also multi-platform so traditionally um pc and some of the biggest titles in the world are still played on pc but increasingly um console is bigger and bigger and of course arguably the fastest growing market and when people ask the question what's the next thing to watch out for in the esports space mobile esports games such as pubg mobile um free fire uh, mobile legends wild rift now and others um generate huge numbers both in terms of player base and in terms of viewership as well that varies a lot region to region which um we'll get on to a little bit later so there are both online and offline competitions of course that's why it's been esports has been a bit more covid proof than others is that of course esports can continue whereas football um table tennis and all the other sports uh, generally have to have had to stop um that's not to say esports hasn't suffered this year it's in a big way um, by the in in terms of the loss of major events but of course it can continue to some degree um i would argue it's not actually antisocial in fact it's quite the opposite events big gaming festivals such as dreamhack there are dreamhack festivals all over the world now from brazil to the us to india through to um, a town in sweden where it all got started in 1994 and this is where people will bring their pcs um and have competitions uh, amongst friends essentially but organized at these big dreamhack events but dreamhacks have now turned into major festivals with that kind of casual um player base and bring your own pc component still a key part of them but there are also top tier esports competitions with big money on the line as a part of it as well alongside lots of other things um connected to uh, gaming culture for one of a better word um esports is an umbrella term just like sports just because i'm a football fan doesn't mean i'm a boxing fan just because i'm a counter strike fan does not mean i'm a league of legends fan and that again is very important to remember um esports is global it's a rapidly growing part of the entertainment sector and it's not going anywhere audiences and fans are diverse and demographics differ game to game um i alluded to this earlier that pubg mobile for example is incredibly popular in indonesia um 
it is not so popular here where I'm sat in London at the moment. So games differ a lot in terms of popularity, um, region to region and country to country. Uh, players make a lot of money. Some of the top players in League of Legends are on hundreds of thousands of pounds or dollars per year. I believe that this varies a lot, but uh, for a top tier Counter-Strike player, don't quote me on this one, but I believe um, the average annual wage is about 200 to 250 um, USD per year, and that's that's before bonuses and everything else. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So again, we'll we'll skip through this one pretty quick. But what is esports and why should you care? Um, just a nod to some of the celebrity investors who are involved. Every, everyone from uh, from J Lo to Michael Jordan to Drake, to Steve Aoki, and, and plenty more. And in terms of the big sports franchises and organizations, um, a lot of them are involved as well. I would give a nod in particular out of those sports teams to the Dallas Cowboys, um, who invested in an esports team called Complexity uh, a good few years ago now. A Complexity are now one of the, the top teams in the world, and Complexity compete in numerous um, different games. Um, some of which they do very well in, <laughs> others are quite so well. Uh, PSG, um, again, are a football team that have done extremely well in the space in terms of entering in a big way. Um, and the, when I speak to football clubs, it's the example of PSG generally that I tend to um, talk through most in terms of one of the most interesting case studies of how they've entered esports and done very well. And next slide, please. Um, so who am I? Who are we? Um, one of the co-founders of Esports Insider. We got started in August 2016. Um, we're still probably best known for esportsinsider.com, which covers the business and industry of esports, much like your um, sports pros, iSports Connect and stuff in the sports world. We do that for esports. Um, since 2017, we started hosting B2B events. Started these at Fnatic which is one of the biggest teams in the world and just so happens to be based here in London. Started those off at their, their place in 2017, 2018, 2019. Outgrew the space somewhat, hosted conferences in New York, um, events in LA, um, in Manchester and elsewhere. Obviously this year uh, we had big plans which have been put on hold to 2021. Um, we also host The Clutch, which is a pitch investment competition uh, most recently in partnership with Deloitte and Nations Ventures, where esports related startups come and pitch to live to a panel of judges and the audience as well. And um, we have our ESI Hall of Fame and we have our WFH League, which is our um, corporate esports league. So where teams are colleagues representing their companies. So raised a bit of money for charity via that this year. It's been, it's been good fun. ESI Connect is our agency. Um, we partnered with CSM sport and entertainment in May this year and via ESI Connect we help to bring brands, suppliers and investors into the space um, in the right way. So obviously it's quite a complex ecosystem and a lot to learn and a lot of people to meet and a lot of different opportunities depending on what your goals are. Uh, finally ESI Media of course we have um, our wider media arm as well, editorial, podcast and video and the Esports Journal um, is our, again, industry-focused print and digital format magazine. So a home for longer, longer form content than esportsinsider.com. We've just had our latest edition come out in the last one of the year. If anyone's a football fan, Sergio Aguero is actually on the front cover, which is fun. And he's uh, launched an esports team quite recently, of which he's currently the CEO. Uh, next slide, please. So who's involved? This is more a visual slide just to give you an idea of the, um, I guess, the diversity of the types of brands and media who are in the space currently. And this is, I think, maybe a year out of date. This, this changes very frequently. Like, uh, yeah, Louis Vuitton, for example, is not there. And Louis Vuitton are active in the space now as well. But as the, the previous speaker talked through in detail, Bookmakers, betting companies are increasingly involved in a big way, but there's food and drinks brands. There are, of course, gaming peripheral brands such as HyperX, but there's ones that you 
might not expect, such as the Mastercards of the world. Um, Bumble, the, uh, I'm not sure how they brand themselves, but the, the dating app, or at least how it started, right? They are now involved in a big way. So there's opportunity for a lot of different types of brands to be in esports. It's just getting it right and learning about the space in full first is very important. Um, in terms of media, you can see them all there. All the big names um, and increasingly uh, traditional broadcasters are looking more and more to esports as well, um, as obviously they increasingly have to consider uh, Twitch, YouTube, and others streaming platforms as big contenders for for their crown and for their viewing audience, in essence. And next slide, please. So how is the esports ecosystem broken down? At the top, we have the game publishers and developers who are all powerful, really, who make ultimately make all of the decisions. So from Riot Games, who own the League of Legends, and a newer title, which is making a lot of noise right now, called Valorant. Um, there's also Valve, who own CSGO and Dota 2, two of the other big titles. Activision Blizzard with Overwatch and Call of Duty. The list goes on. It's incredibly competitive because video games make a lot of money, on which esports is the increasingly large cherry on the top. Um, so beneath the game publishers and developers, you have the stream of platforms, which we talked through earlier as Twitch, um, YouTube, Douyu, Huya in, um, in different parts of the world. The tournament organizers, the biggest of which, well, two of the biggest, ESL, who merged with DreamHack recently, same parent company, ESL will run the tournaments and the big events on behalf of the game publishers and developers. Well, I'll caveat that to say that sometimes the game publishers and developers will choose to run the tournaments and big events themselves, a la Riot Games, um, Agati Blizzard, and others. And that, that's why the decisions of the game publishers are so vital to the esports ecosystem, because if Valve turn around and decide that they're gonna run their own events soon, then that's gonna make life hard for the numerous um, tournament organizers that vie to host the big competitions in their games. And then there's the teams, of course, that we heard from Vexed earlier, great org, um, but there are many, many more. Um, as we said, the likes of PSG are entering the space now, Complexity, Team Liquid, Fnatic, Ninjas in Pajamas, the strange names are many, uh, but there are many teams and it's a big space because of course there are many games as well. But the most teams will compete in various games and that again depends on where they're based their focus points and such but we can talk about that later or anyone can reach out if they have questions vexed of course can help on that one as well and beneath the tournament organizers and this tier i suppose venues um, of course vital increasingly teams are now building or locating their own um hqs and venues by which to welcome fans in have a store um, host events for, for themselves and of course have a place for their players to play, meet and such. And then there's the fans, the various agencies and suppliers which we won't get into but which are many and the sponsors and brands which we just went over. Uh, next slide please. So which brands are actively involved? Well, there's very many different types as we went through just now but three types here are some of the more active in the space currently. Um, bookmakers are, to be honest, vital to the space and increasingly I, I'm keen to see more and more regulated bookmakers enter the space. Um, that's somewhat made difficult at times because in top tier League of Legends, for example, the biggest game in the world, most established, by many metrics anyway, most established esports ecosystem, um, teams aren't allowed to have bookmakers as sponsors because Riot Games say so. Um, dissimilarly in um, big Counter-Strike events, teams are allowed to have um, bookmakers as sponsors because Valve are a lot more open to that slash the tournament operators that run these big events on Valve's behalf. 
Um, that's why you've seen Betway have established a very strong, long-lasting partnership with a team called Ninjas in Pajamas. But all of these brands, many of which I'm sure you've heard of, are, are making a lot of noise and um, supporting the ecosystem and partnering with both teams and tournament operators in the way of sponsorship and such. Um, Poker Stars, more recently, a more recent entrant, for example, partnered with um, a Brazilian team called Furia. Uh, game and tech is an obvious one, right? It's an obvious audience um, and an obvious sponsorship play. But these are some of the brands that, again, have supported teams and tournaments for a long time, and their kit sells for quite a pretty penny at times. But again, lots of brands, and that's going to become more and more of a competitive space, I think. Similarly, apparel, fashion, and sportswear, um, Nike, Adidas, all the others you see here, Nike and Adidas, the, the war is very much on in esports for them as it is in, um, in football and traditional sports. Champion are involved in a lot of teams. Um, some of the more luxury brands we've seen enter more recently as well, such as Gucci, partnered with Fnatic for, um, uh, granted, a very limited edition watch, but it sold out at least. Um, and Louis Vuitton, that's a very cool partnership, which is worth looking into what they have done in League of Legends and all these brands as well. I'm, I'm sure more and we'll see more and more sportswear brands, more and more fashion and luxury brands enter the space in the next year or two. The next slide, please. Um, I think we're running out of time, so I'll go through this one very quickly. But the revenue channels for stakeholders in esports, the main channels right now are sponsorship. That is a big part of the pie. Thank you to Nuzu for those stats there. Sponsorship in esports currently is vital. Why is that? That's because media rights is not as developed as it could and will be because people have been used to watching it on, watching the big competitions for free on Twitch for such a long time and other broadcasters weren't getting involved until much more recently, which meant less competition and and so on. Again, we can talk through that in the Q&A or feel free to reach out to me. Media rights is a small part of the pie right now, but growing and will grow. And um, similarly, if merchandise is important for sure, and is more important for some teams and such than others, but increasingly that will become um, more important as well. Um, other channels, of course, tickets into events, publisher fees, streaming, um, a lot of teams aren't just competitive organizations such as FaZe Clan. They will compete for sure and they have their viewer esports side, but they also have their streaming arm where they have um, content creators. And that's just, that's the, the revenues under streaming. And um, other education, digital marketplaces, more and more teams are launching memberships and subscription services. And that is a trend I'm sure will continue. Uh, next slide, please. That's everything. Nice, Thank you very much for listening. And I believe we are now on to the Q&A section. Thank you. Hi, dear Hi. participants yes. who have been hanging on there with us. Um, is there anybody in the audience who would like to ask our speakers a question? If that is the case, please raise your hand using the little hand function at the... Um, at the bottom of your screen, um, and we will give you the floor. I see there's a question from uh, Alagar Tepelea. Um, Lisa, could you um, uh, unmute Alagar? Yeah, Alagar, please go ahead, um, ask your question, and to whom you would like to ask the question. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Uh, I think so. Okay, thank you. Um, my question goes out uh, especially to Sam and Kay, um, but thank you all for the wonderful presentations. Um, I represent a company that is um, specializing in uh, biofeedback for esports, and I have seen that you described the industry becoming more professional, and also that there is a lot of gaming tech um, involved and a lot of um, ecosystem players who, who produce tech, especially for, for this industry. And I'm wondering how you see the professionalization going forward, because we have heard that 
it used to be the nerds in the basement and now it's becoming a real sports, a real industry. And how, 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 which trends do you see? Um, what, what is the future in terms of this being like extremely competitive and you know, as competitive as, as soccer or even more? Okay, thanks for your question. Maybe Pei, uh, uh, you want to go first? Okay, uh, if I may. Uh, sorry for Sam. <laughs> um, so um, in terms of growing, I think really um, what, as I said in my presentation, I think um, esports is a natural uh, entertainment for the younger generation. So there's an audience which is ready there who is born in digital era, who are familiar with the technology, they're familiar with uh, all the platform that my generation are not familiar with. So, so this is really uh, an entertainment that it can be a, on a professional level, but can also be a huge part of the, the daily um, life. Um, and if we talk about a future trend, I think uh, Sam uh, mentioned a little bit in his presentation, it's mobile. Okay, um, is what we see already today, if we, we look at the, the audience of uh, eSports, which is mainly millennial and Gen Z and younger, um, we already see the difference between, the gener between this generation. So millennials are more attached to PC titles because they were born with PCs. Um, and then if you look at uh, Generation Z, that they are more born with the mobile uh, because when they were born, mobile were more powerful than before. So mobile becomes a more preferred uh, technology platform. Um, so that's why uh, naturally we see today uh, in the esports thing a huge growth on mobile esports um, parts of the, the esports. Um, just because mobile as a technology is easier than PC, it's less uh, investment and it's quicker and more accessible. So I think a lot of the future trend will have to do with the technology um, um, evolution as well. That's my personal opinion. Maybe Sam wants to add something? Yeah, um, yeah, no, I completely agree um, with that fully. Um, I would say another thing to watch out for and what I would, what I want to see more of is um, education and, and by education I mean everything from schools through to universities and colleges working more and more with um, the esports industry and embracing it more. I think in certain, in Denmark for example, there are numerous um, esports societies and clubs at schools, right? In the UK that is not a thing. At universities, yeah. But that's going to become increasingly a thing and that is i think it's a good thing for all schools and colleges and universities that recognize that um esports and video games don't have to just be this bad hobby that you push to the side it can be very good for um improving like attention teamwork numerous things it's good for people's mental health that's been very proven um but more than that there's is vital for the esports industry that we are more open to working with education in that way as well because what we need to do is broaden um the playing field right like make esports as accessible um and uh, to as many people as possible and make it better known to as many people as possible because that will enable more kids to start playing it that will get more people interested in watching different games and such as well I think that's vital is um, increasing access to these games because the, the beauty of esports is that I can pick up and play a game with someone wherever, right? In the world, arguably. Um, but that's not necessarily true because obviously like, you need the console, you need the PC, right? That's why mobile esports is growing so fast and is so accessible. But I think if education, the education sector embraces esports more, we can increase accessibility considerably. And on the economic side of that, there's a look at a company called Play Versus, so P-O-A-Y-V-S. There's um, a lot of money to be made in that space as well. 
Okay, so thank you can, both can I ask a follow-up question? Well, Alavar, can I? Uh, a very quick one, because we have a few more questions. So quick one and a quick answer. Yeah, Tell just us. towards the, the training of the players. How, how do you see that becoming um, more professional? Like, um, you know, they used to drink Red Bull and uh, not be very athletic. And now we see some teams that are really making them uh, train like, like um, a, a professional Olympian almost. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the top teams now are, are hiring nutritionists and such, right? And are, are hiring performance coaches because they recognize that um, if people are fit and healthy in both body and mind, then they're likely to play better. And also having those kind of components and offerings in place makes for a cooler offering for the top players, right? Like that's why top footballers will join Man City and not another team because the facilities to an extent are incredible and it's all part of the package that they can offer to players and it's important overall for performance so i think yeah, nutritionists performance coaches will become more and more commonplace it just happens to be that revenues are very tight at almost all esports teams right now and so they have to choose what's the priority like keeping the lights on and making sure they can get to katavicha to play csgo or having that nutritionist Obviously, the former comes first, but the latter will come as revenues increase. Thank you. Okay, Alada, thank you so much for your question. Then I, we would like to move to Franz Rösler. Uh, he was a hand up. Lisa, could you unmute um, Franz? Yes. Yeah, uh, I think yes. I hope hope you can hear me. A uh, fascinating uh, uh, webinar and really fun to listen to. Uh, we, of course, uh, as, as a straight commission, we give advice, you know, to newcomers uh, to Asia, maybe. And it really showed that Hong Kong has, you know, a role also for mainland China and maybe also for Asia. But where to start? Is there any advice from your side, uh, you know, for newcomers who would like to tap into this ecosystem? And Sam mentioned it so, so clearly. There's a whole ecosystem around this, 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 the esports already. Where to start? Are there some main events? Um, communities you would recommend uh, like Austrian companies to tap in? And Sam, any yeah, um, insights yes. from you or maybe from from Pei or where yeah. do I see him? Paul, the step to Asia? Um, Is that Hong Kong? Is it a place to start or if they have to go somewhere else? Yeah. What would you need, for example, Paul, um, to, um, um, would you consider, have you been considering Hong Kong? Um, yes, no. Um, what would you need for it to be attractive to you? Absolutely. So we, we have been in Hong Kong, as mentioned shortly in the presentation. Um, Hi, Paul. It was a great <laughs> program by, by um, Go Hong Kong from the Austrian Chamber of Commerce. And it was really great, one month to, to get everybody to know, like the investors, the startup um, environment, also tax advisors and uh, um, legal advisors, how to set up the company. So I think for an Austrian company, it's quite easy to move to Hong Kong. This is, um, yeah, one month's preparation or like this event would be enough. I think uh, though China is a different animal and it, it, it would need to be made step by step, at least in my opinion, what I have seen, First would be Hong Kong, and then you would need probably more time to go into China as well. But such um, programs like we participated are really, really like a gate open. I can highly recommend this to anyone. Just really go there and, and make the contacts. It's really different than having phone calls. Can I ask one question to Pei following up on that? Hey, you are now um, big in the UK and, and big in Europe. Do you have any Asia plans? Oh, yes, uh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, I, mean as, uh, well, I, I think there's two levels uh, to that question. So the first, that eSport, as we mentioned uh, in the presentation, uh, it is a digital uh, sport. Digital means that it's from the first second worldwide, you're seen by worldwide population. Okay, if your channel is correct, the audience is correct. So for example, in, in eSport teams, it's very, very um, common that you see a team, even 
as us today branded as UK team, uh, not all our players are British. Um, so we don't really care where the players come from, where is, what is your nationality, your age, your color, you know, whatever. But what we uh, care is that you play well. So as a brand, we brand ourselves to an international fan. We don't really, you know, uh, block ourselves or limit ourselves on the UK territory or European territory. But of course, uh, e-sport fan as traditional sport fan, there's a kind of a nationalism uh, inside uh, their uh, fan followings. So uh, they will champion, you know, what they, they will support their uh, famous national team. So we as an e-sport um, organization, if we want to um, develop a certain region, the best way will be actually uh, partner with a local team and use that local team to make our communication in a more efficient way with that particular country. So we always work on two levels, the international level for sure from day one, but then when your, um, your financial capacity or your team capacity grow, you will then grow to a more uh, local region by teaming up with other teams. Okay, and that actually ties in what also with Hopin Tung said, right? It's um, you get the audience when people recognize themselves also in the in the in the players in the drivers, right? Yeah. I see another question from Jordi Class here. Um, Lisa, could you uh, unmute Jordi? Jordi, yes. you are um, the floor is yours. What is your question? Yes, can you all hear me? Um, I think so. <laughs> presentations, first of all. Um, I w had a more question on the regional side of esports. So we, we all know that esports is more internationally on the international stage. And we was wondering as a project manager for uh, in Belgium, how we can more develop and, and make it a sustainable development for the more regional side. How we can, with governments and institutions, to make sure that we promote and create awareness for esports on a local level and how to, to organize that from, from the start and how, has have a good starting base for, uh, for more local development of esports and so, what your vision is on, on that. Right, so, so local, Jordi, for you is, is Belgium, Europe, right? Local you... can even be smaller uh, to the extent like more to a province or, or something. Okay. Well. Oh, I get the question. Um, you wanted to ask that to one of the speakers in particular, Jordi? Um, I think uh, anyone who has a, a view of okay. local esports. So, um, so esports uh, speakers uh, are also the sports speakers. Uh, any any views? Sam, Paul, Pei? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, that somewhat leaks into what I was saying earlier about the links to education, right? Like schools colleges, universities, all of that, like that's, that's how grassroots, that's how a grassroots scene generally emerges. That's the foundations. And that's what's very important for the continued growth of esports more broadly. So I'd say um, educating those um, educational institutions is the important thing, first of all, like if there's, it depends where you're based, right? Um, if there's a lack of awareness to begin with, it's just ensuring that the leaders in these colleges and such know about the positive benefits of esports and how what it can offer to their students. I'd say that's one. Um, two is also again access, which means um, a venue in some way, shape, or form, and that's obviously difficult because that takes an investor that believes in the idea, the ones to look at of and what Mike Sepso, who's like a, a bit of a, like a legend in the esports industry, his company now is called Vindex. Um, Vindex have signed a deal with Belong by Game, like the so these are uh, um, gaming arenas. Arena being a very grandiose term for a store, basically. But the game stores in the UK and Spain and elsewhere. And that business was struggling, right? And then they they amended it and focused on what they call the <laughs> long gaming arenas, where there's each 
um, store, each belong game and venue has its own team and that within it creates a sense of community. Like you, you belong, like that's your local team and they will play against one another. Vindex, um, which is a US company, have signed a deal to bring that model to the US and more internationally as well for what Mike has called um, hometown esports. Uh, that's this is the guy that wrote the blueprint for the Overwatch League that starts was on one of the co-founders of MLG, like one of the first professional leagues in the early noughties. He's now focused on hometown esports and the localization of it, which is increasing audience. And as you say, like what can you do locally and regionally? It's hard when there's not a place for people to come and meet and play or watch together as well. Yes. So uh, I say that the venues is the most important thing like there's the Belong Arenas, there's um, look at Kingwin, the Kingwin Esports Performance Centers in Poland. Um, there's an esports and gaming bar and restaurant here in London called Platform, which is much more, you can go and like book a console booth or a PC and play for a while. That's what Wan Yu is very big at, which is another Chinese um, gaming PC cafe chain. But Platform is more about the wider social experience. Like you'll go there and there's nice drinks and good food and like you take a date there. And oh, it just so happens that CSGO is on the TV and not football. But obviously all of these venues and facilities take investment. So yeah, yeah. get talking to investors <laughs> and schools, colleges and unis, I would say. Thank you. Hey, thanks Jordi for your question. I see another question from uh, George Amerla. Lisa, could you unmute George? George, um, I think Lisa is almost unmuting you. Um, yeah. uh, I have a question for Hoping Tung. Goedemiddag uh, trouwens, uh, Hoping. My question is, uh, you have been a Formula One driver. Uh, when will we see the next Chinese Formula One driver? Ooh, that's something that's always exciting to, to think about. I think um, at the moment, there is a Chinese driver, uh, Zhou Guanyu, in uh, Formula 2, which is basically the last feeder series up to Formula 1. Um, they're actually racing this weekend in Bahrain um, for the last few races of, the, of their championship. Um, he's actually, funny enough, also in the junior program of Renault 1 team. Um, so I would say if any of the Chinese drivers, he's probably closest to Formula 1. The seats for this year are already confirmed within the team, so the team, there's so no chance. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Anna Elferink, I see with a question. Lisa, if you can unmute Anna. Um, it's yes, can you Anna, please ask yes. your question. Yes, uh, Anna Elfring, um, I represent Utrecht region. We are helping here uh, foreign companies to establish themselves. We are very strong in gaming because we'll have, like it was mentioned, we have the uh, university here and we also home to Team Liquid. Of course, you know this uh, company as well. Uh, my question is actually to uh, Sam and Pei, maybe someone can help you uh, to answer my question. Of course, esports is a very international uh, arena, but I'm wondering would Brexit has impact on that? Or would be then companies in esports moving from England, say, to Europe? Um, do you have any insight in that regard? Sam, um, pay. <laughs> pay, go ahead. Well, I, I, th I think it's a, it's a difficult question, <laughs> to be honest. Because uh, why a company choose uh, a location, you know, there's a lot of reason. Uh, obviously, we are UK team for the moment. Uh, we're based in, well, majority players are based in UK. We have players from Sweden, uh, from Poland, and, and they play online. Uh, and we are, for the moment, still in, in the UK for historical reason. Uh, tomorrow, who knows, once we got uh, more investment or... Um, Maybe we will move to a country where the, the you know, the, the tax uh, <laughs> will be more uh, incentive for us. So there, there's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, criteria to be, uh, to be considered. But I think from um, the example of Katowice that I gave uh, in my presentation, that I think is the effort of the city of Katowice 
who wants to actually change their image because Katowice was a mining, uh, an industrial city that after the mining period, they, have, they can no longer uh, attract younger people to stay in the city. So they started to think about transformation and what is best for transforming is digital technology. So eSport is one of the plan of the city of Katowice. So today, Katowice not only uh, attract a huge eSport crowd, also attract uh, eSport company um, who work on software or services or, you know, batting or, or whatever. So it, it's difficult for, for me to answer the question, why would I move from UK to another country? But I think uh, if the country had, well, if the country or the city has a uh, a very concrete plan to transform itself and go forward to the digital technology and digital business, then you will succeed uh, one day for sure. Okay, Sam, anything to add? Have you planned your European office just yet? Well, well I mean, I'll do anything to leave this country right now. So yeah, if anyone's got a, got a visa, just let me know. But um, no, on a, on a, well, I say it on a more serious note, I am serious. But uh, there's there's cities such as Amsterdam, right, which are very, and, and Lisbon for, for thinking of another one, but Amsterdam in particular, because there's a new venue called H2O. Um, I don't know Amsterdam too well, but it's just on the outskirts. I think I'm going to go next year, hopefully. But they're very focused on esports and gaming. Um, they're looking at the potential to host um, esports and gaming related startups there, right? Because I have one. One thing that the UK is good for esports in a way, in that it's one of the biggest video games, has one of the most established video games industries in the world, right? Like fifth or sixth biggest in the world in terms of like developers based there, publishers, et cetera, et cetera, and all the perks attached to that. Esports wise, it's a, I guess, a little bit more behind. Um, what I think we could do better here or what other European or anywhere countries could do if they want to attract esports companies, the vast majority of esports companies are very small. <laughs> a lot of them don't have um, big offices and blah, blah, blah. Like it's important to ensure that there's video games, which is massive, and there's esports, which is like the very new small part. And in, for sure it's growing fast, but it's still tiny. There's a lot of esports startups and small companies that would benefit a lot from um, cheap rent in a co-working space with other similar companies, right? And like, that's what I think H2O will become in Amsterdam. Um, I would love for ESI and other like, companies that I'm involved with to be based somewhere like that. But there's not many places like that that exist. And obviously, if it was, for example, like um, an accelerator slash incubator program attached to that co-working space and venue, there's huge potential for, um, for a city to be seen as like, like, like Berlin is a case in point of one which is, has a lot of esports companies based there because that's where the LEC, like the European League of Legends Championship takes place. And so Riot have a big presence there, um, which means the teams do and so on and so forth. But there's a lot of potential for um, cities to give a better offering, I suppose, to the esports industry because of how relatively young most of the companies are. If that answers your question, so I don't know, but yeah, a visa. Both for your <laughs> insights, Anna. If you allow me, there's um, we have a um, we can come back to you, but that we have a slight time squeeze and a question that we received. Um, and I would like to ask to Bettina, um, before you want to leave us, Bettina, we know you're in a time squeeze. Yes, yes, um, I am. It's, it's, a, it's a twofold one, quick one. Um, you have a lot of experience in China from a, from a competitive sports player, as well as a journalist. Um, any um, number one tip for a company that wants to be successful in China? What would you, from your experience, give them? That's my question one. And the question two is, um, apart from the pyramid that you had described and, the, and the, the developments in modern sports, is there any 
key personality trait that makes Chinese so successful in a range of sports. So your winning tip for business people and um, any insights in personality mentality that makes the Chinese sports people do very well on the world stage. Yeah, well, um, I'm, I'm listening to the other speakers. It's very interesting for me because, you know, I, I feel really old fashioned when I will hear all these stories about esports and so on. And then at the same time, I think, uh, well, uh, esports, I can understand. This is a real big development, very interesting. And so many people are interested. Uh, young people want to, to play sports, you know, behind their computer or, or the iPhone. Um, but I think, and that's maybe also um, an answer on your first uh, question, that, uh, of course, it's real important now in China, if, you know, to be successful as a business developer, it's real important to put uh, attention to the physical uh, part of sports because you know China is um, on a big in a big stress because um, a lot of people they um, they don't have time to to do physical exercise because they have to work too hard you know and uh, I think uh, especially when you want to be successful you must play uh, pay attention to um, to the physical parts of sports because um, the healthcare system is under a, a lot of stress and I think there's a lot uh, in this area there's a lot to gain and uh, especially in the prevention part you know to to get people out of their chair and uh, to put uh, emphasis on the physical part and also I think it's uh, um, when you want to be successful as a business partner, of course, this is a real cliche. You have to build um, a partnership. You have to be um, to, to show that you are interested in, in the people, uh, in the people of China. And I think this is um, the first thing you have to um, have to work on uh, to, to, to build relationships and to build friendship. And of course, maybe Hong Kong is a little, little bit difficult, uh, different from, from China. But uh, for me, uh, why did I succeed in China? Because uh, I was always welcome there because I was really interested in the, their way of doing things and of, in, in their culture and um, even in their language. Uh, this is the first one. The second one, okay. you have to remember what was the second question. The second one was, do you see any um, uh, different approach um, in top sports people in China from top sports people in Europe, say? Uh, or would you say the, the, um, the desire to win and, and to be the best is a universal thing? I think it's a universal thing, but the Chinese, they are, you know, masters in bearing hardship. I mean, this is, you know, not in comparison to, to Western countries. I mean, uh, as I see, as I regard my my own sports table tennis, for for instance, now Chen Meng, she's the world champion in uh, ladies' female table tennis. And see, I lately um, read an interview with her and she said, um, uh, I don't uh, give myself rest. I, I only I only practice and I sleep and I eat and that's what I do. Eight hours a day practice, and uh, now in in Western countries we think of how can we do everything efficiently. Uh, uh, we have to 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 uh, also pay attention to rest and. Uh, um, to food and everything. The Chinese also do that, but I still work harder than, than Western countries. I'm sure about that. So it's dedication, dedication, dedication. And when you think you're ready, a bit more. Yes, that's Sorry. it. Okay. Yes. It is okay. Music thing. Yeah. No. yes, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Bettina. Um, People, I realize we're half a year or uh, half a year, half an hour over time. So I would like to wrap it up uh, by giving the word to my colleague Wing Hin. Anybody who has outstanding questions, send us an email or upon receiving the PDF of the presentations, approach the speakers directly. Wing, over to you. Thank you so much, Paula. And thank you very much, especially 
to Marco and all the wonderful speakers at today's webinar. I have learned so much and about the permeability between traditional sports and esports and digital sports. And I think that esports uh, is at the forefront of uh, a development um, because it also hinges and um, pushes digital marketing. And I've learned about so that so many brands are now also um, jumping onto the train of esports and uh, trying to reach um, the, the audience. And this is, I think, uh, a wonderful development. And, and to the questions we had, for instance, from Sam and from Pei uh, about a good location, I think Hong Kong is a wonderful location also for um, small companies and for esports companies in, in particular, because we have a cyber port in Hong Kong, which hosts um, uh, uh, not only an excellent infrastructure for uh, startups and uh, young companies, but also offers cheap rent in co-working spaces. And we can inform you about all these. And um, my colleagues, um, Andrew is based in London, um, Paul is based in Brussels, and um, I with my team um, are based in Berlin. So we take care of um, different countries. We welcome all of you to consider Hong Kong and um, check it out. Um, Hong Kong is a wonderful des destination, um, especially for, for, for small companies and for innovative companies and uh, to tap into the vast growing market of Asia and China. Thank you very much again.